Um, very excited to uh, discuss today some design considerations for flex and rigid flex. Um, there's a lot to talk about, but I will only be speaking for about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, one sentence about CR circuits, we do PCB fabrication and assembly, and we've been doing it for a long time, and everything is manufactured out of the Bay Area, so our main focus is quick cycle time. Uh, and we recently acquired a mil spec and ad cap certified factory in Wisconsin. So we're uh, trying uh, to our hat at uh, more production oriented uh, complex work. So very exciting times at Sierra Circuits. And uh, thanks again for, for joining. I've been doing this for a long time. I'll just skip that. Uh, so uh, this is the quick table of contents. I think all these topics are very important. Um, there's no one topic more important than another, in my opinion. But this today's uh, this is the topics for today's discussion on uh, flex and rigid flex. So, just a real quick uh, uh, introduction to the materials. So, flex substrates are made of polyimide materials. Um, you know, PCB materials need to be able to withstand shock, vibration. Um, solder reflow process, you know, all of that. And then they also need to perform well, um, you know, with uh, in terms of signal integrity and controlled impedance. Um, Flex traditionally has been a little bit behind in uh, electrical properties compared to rigid materials. Uh, so today we'll address some tricks that you can do. Um, and just as a side note, uh, we have been doing projects with um, some Flex material manufacturers um, you know, to try and help them with their electrical performance of their materials. So I'm sure there'll be lots of changes in the industry, um, you know, soon. So I think that's great. One thing to really uh, know the difference as well, other than electrical performance, uh, flex materials use what's called uh, ED copper or electrodeposited copper. Um, you know, another way to say it is like kind of rolled and annealed copper. Um, Oh, sorry, I got that backwards. So rigid boards use ED or electrodeposited copper and flex and rigid flex type, type of materials use the rolled and annealed copper, which has better properties. And that's what uh, this slide is about. So if you take a look at this, you'll see that the, um, you know, the elongation tensile strength are better uh, for rolled and annealed copper. So when you go through your material selection for flex materials, definitely talk to your manufacturer. But in general, there is adhesive-based and adhesive-less. Uh, adhesive-less um, means that it's more like a rigid core. And adhesive-based means that there's adhesive uh, as well um, in your stack up. Now, adhesive can cause all sorts of reliability issues. Uh, so just really be aware, are you using an adhesive base or adhesive list um, material set? And so adhesives, uh, I've seen, you know, when you're trying to uh, clean the inside of the via using a plasma, for example, uh, that adhesive may react differently than the other materials in your stack up, especially a rigid flex stack up. And so you have to be careful of, you know, the reliability side of the of things for the board, like, um, you know, wicking and, you know, proper etch back and um, any sort of dendrite growth that can happen. Uh, so yeah, just be aware of those things is I guess the point. And uh, the second example is adhesive lists. Uh, here are some of the types of adhesives used. Now, I can't say this is a rigid flex or flex uh, webinar without talking about bend radius. Uh, so bend radius is really important. Um, every manufacturer has a slightly different take on bend radius. But I think the key thing is to know, are you designing for the bend radius that you need? Uh, and that's really determined um, by the thickness of your dielectric materials 
and also how you lay out your PCB or how you design your PCB on those uh, flex layers. So uh, just be really aware of that. That's, that's an important thing. And we'll discuss a little bit that later. So here also we want to bring in electrical factors um, that can, you know, also impact the bend uh, capabilities of your board. So control impedance designs, they may require thicker flex materials, um, which again, thicker materials can reduce your bend radius. So in the order of things, you should probably have your understanding of the mechanicals first uh, and then but at the same time, kind of in parallel, what are your electrical requirements? And is there controlled impedance on this design? And what kind of thicknesses and uh, trace widths are you gonna be aiming for to meet your impedance requirements? Once mechanicals are set in place, it becomes very hard for any changes to happen, right? So I would say try and do those in uh, parallel. So in terms of, uh, design rules uh you know this is a pretty uh boilerplate but important that you on the flex especially uh you don't want any sharp edges you want some nice rounded corners uh, when you're designing flex boards and then when you're designing uh you need to know you need to be aware of your core uh, and how you're designing on either side of your core and you don't want to have your conductors line up. You want a staggered approach to how your conductors um, are placed from layer to layer. Uh, so that's an important aspect for the bendability um, for flex boards. Uh, I know that if you're, you have concerns for crosstalk and things like that, you would do um, perpendicular traces on every other layer and uh, in flex you don't always have that luxury so just to be aware of how your traces are placed on either side of a flex core um, can be really uh, helpful and important to your to your bendability uh -huh. so here uh, rigid flex design guides uh, also include stack up so stack up considerations are you know, really understand your via keep out areas, you know, where your cover lay is going to go. Um, you know, those are important things to uh, keep, keep, in, uh, keep in mind. And here you can see the cover lay doesn't go all the way through the, the complete construction, which is really important. So we want to always balance the rigid sections. Uh, you don't want an uneven thickness on the rigid section. So if you have a rigid flex rigid, if you can keep the rigid sections to the same thicknesses um, at the very minimum, that would be the most ideal uh, thing to do. Um, some common uh, flex cores, one mil can be a you know, very common use case, but when you're doing controlled impedance designs, we recommend to have a little bit thicker um, flex materials, uh, like two to three mils. And in terms of copper weights, your options are, there is a third ounce, there's also half ounce and one ounce. So all those um, can be used. So for via keep out areas, cover lays must protrude uh, within uh, the rigid sections by minimal distance to ensure that um, they are, you know, let's say laminated within the, the rigid area. So you want to get a good, uh, good mechanical strength there. You also at the same time need to keep an understanding of your hole to flex or hole to transition area uh, in mind so that again, there's good flow of prepreg around the via and that that prepreg doesn't flow out onto the flex area, which would also hamper your, your, bend, your bend radius. Here's another uh, kind of way to do your stack ups um, called the air gap construction. So there are benefits to this, uh, especially in high layer count 
uh, rigid flexes. Um, you know, the idea here is to keep uh, sub constructions of your flex layers, um, you know, to help with the I beam effect and, uh, you know, basically help with reliability and bendability. We kind of talked about this a little bit uh, or showed a picture where is the selective coverlay uh, type of construction. Um, because your via is not being drilled through uh, the coverlay, it, it really helps with roughening up the whole wall and the recipes for the plasma in manufacturing. So there's a benefit for that and there's just a general benefit for reliability like I had discussed. So I would say keep to this type of a construction. Uh, when you're designing uh, rigid flex. So for controlled impedance and flex boards, uh, just a quick uh, comment that um, you can do you can do controlled impedance in flex designs uh, and strip line geometry is about 75% thicker than microstrip. Um, things you have to keep in, keep in mind, just like in a rigid, is uh, thickness of your cores and your copper traces and the material properties of polyamide and the coverlay. So when your fab fabricator or yourself is doing some analysis, you know, make sure you get the right um, effective DK as you're planning your impedance traces. Also, we encourage a crosshatch, um, you know, to maintain the flexibility uh, of your flex portion of your rigid flex, but then also you have to take into account how that impacts your impedance models. So here's an example when describing a crosshatch plane, the ratio of the crosshatch conductor width uh, to the crosshatch pitch is crucial. So if the ratio is about 0.293, 50% of the copper removal can, can be achieved less of the ratio, the greater the copper removal. And CI flex designs call for higher impedance, therefore it's always recommended to keep this ratio as low as possible. So how to maintain signal integrity of your flex design. So cross hatch re does reduce some, because of the variation, uh, some resonance. So um, and affects overall signal quality. So here's a little trick that you can do. Um, you can align the differential pairs to have more uh, symmetry. So the top one is recommended, the bottom is not. So we prefer the diamond uh, crosshatch. Uh, you know, the key is from a manufacturing standpoint to follow your manufacturer's guidelines on the crosshatch. Um, you know, you want it. You don't want any etching issues as well. So a few slides on the shielding uh, for flex boards. So shielding for flex PCBs is done using these materials, copper um, specialized shielding films or silver ink. So using copper, uh, you know, you want to link uh, you know, your crosshatch planes to ground through stitched vias. Uh, the signal layers can be sandwiched between the shield layers, and the shielding solution is also utilized in rigid designs. Uh, when compared to copper layers, silver ink offers the benefit of a more flexibility uh, and in high volumes, lower cost. In prototypes, not lower cost. Although the ink is more flexible than copper, it still requires an extra cover lay to encase and preserve the silver ink. Uh, so you have to be careful about that. There's also specialized uh, shielding films. So in this structure, um, you have your conductive adhesive, a metallic uh, deposition layer, and an exterior insulating layer, and everything's laminated together. Um, so in my mind, when you have, when you introduce this type of system, it's not always recommended in impedance designs as it, uh, you know, it has adverse effects on that. 
Uh, and then, you know, basics for a rigid flex design. Um, it's always nice to teardrop your vias as well as in rigid. You can also add the cat ears um, as anchors. Those can sometimes help. You want to minimize your bending in the in, you know, number of vias in the flex region um, because when things bend, they can crack. Uh, and here is uh, an, a kind of an idea that, you know, at some point you do want an overlap um, so that you can, you know, not create a, a stress point. Here are a few more points for rigid flex. Um, again, about talking about some some stiffer stiffeners and you know the key thing is when you have to get these rules right. Your how close your hole is to the flex transition area. Um, you know, be aware of the stack up because you know you might have extra flow um, that your fabricator would have to deal with. So this is how manufacturing interplays with your electrical requirements and your controlled impedance structures. So working with your fabricator upfront on the stack up. Uh, you know, specific to your design um, is really key. I'm going to switch it over now to our partners in crime, and I'll let Steve, um, you know, share his screen. Okay, thank you, Amit. Give me one second here, and I'll get set up. Let's see. Need to switch that view. Sorry about that. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about DFM for flex and rigid flex. Um, you know, terminology wise, uh, it's. Uh, you know, it's basically semantics. There's a lot of commonality in there. Uh, so I'm Steve Watt. I'm uh, Sozo Center Engineering Manager with Zookin USA. And so these are some of the general topics we'll talk about. Challenges in the Flex PCB verification and new product introduction. introduction um, an introduction to our solution in that space, which is ADM. Um, and then some session takeaways. So let's talk first about challenges. You know, there's a lot of challenges in this space. You know, competition is is constantly putting cost pressure on on any products that we produce. Uh, you know, a lot of the data exchange formats that have been kind of institutionalized over the years uh, lack fidelity. They they're they they're very pointed at a, at an end item, but there's not a lot of data in there that lets you kind of analyze what the intent was. Um, Traditional PCB differs quite a bit from flex and rigid flex. There's a, quite a significant superset of objects that get involved in flex and rigid flex. And then, you know, the manufacturing requirements are pretty disconnected from the ECAD system. You know, uh, ECAD is pretty good with copper, solder mask, things that it expects, um, but it's not good with ethereal objects um, that that maybe don't really exist in an intelligent way in ECAD. And then gathering all that information from manufacturing and ensuring that you have access to that information in the design phases is a significant effort. Um, but it's an effort worth, worth pursuing because if you think your design is done and you throw it over the wall to CAM and you get back a design with a significant amount of changes, well, that's the worst time in a design phase to institutionalize or integrate these changes in. Because um, in your mind, everything's set. Um, and a lot of objects that could have been anticipated earlier in the design process and made for a much more streamlined flow are being missed by not having uh, a proper DFM tool built into your design process. So. You know, DFM verification is required for globalization. You know, you've got multiple production sites. Um, you've got multiple design sites. 
Um, and everybody's kind of in this disconnected flow and not really sharing that data. Um, so intelligent formats like 2581 and ODB++ are kind of the new standards for data exchange. You know, many companies are supporting data from multiple CAD tools. So, you know, how do you integrate that into a DFM flow? Um, and you need DFM verification for targeted board technologies. So, you, you know, not all boards are created equal. So you may have a commodity product that has vastly different rules than some controlled impedance, you know, high density board that you're trying to, to get through DFM. And, you know, verification needs to be configured for the production sites. They may have different capabilities or standards that they want you to adopt. Um, so, you know, you've got to be equipped to do that. So, you know, in lieu of that, you've got to support intelligent formats. You've got to have data compatibility among, among multi, multiple PCB CADs or EDA vendors. Um, you've got to have a capability to, to do some DFM rule management um, and also some rule distribution. You've got to be able to share those rules, both with your collaboration partners and with other sites that are doing the same thing. So you need an integrated DFM verification environment. And DFM is the term I've been using, but in reality, DFM is DFX. Um, you've got to accommodate fabrication, assembly, test, quality, cost. All of those pieces need to be built into your DFM solution um, because all of those pieces can drive the viability of your product. Um, you know, if you're doing it piecemeal, you know, send it to fab, have them evaluate it, and then send it to assembly and have them evaluate it. You're just extending your design phase out by a significant amount. You want it all done in, in one sweep. So there's kind of a hub and spoke approach to this with, you know, the functional requirements for the VF DFM tools, and then a lot of different pieces that drive what those requirements are, you know, yield optimization, support for multiple CAD tools, uh, fabrication division uh, requirements, you know, so you've got to have a common verification environment to streamline that streamline fab and assembly across that supply chain. You need to have a, an understanding of what those verification items are. You got to cover DFX as well as accommodate third party assembly. And then intelligent formats have to be supported to drive that acceleration. You've got to be able to have a repeatable process. Um, and so that needs to be supported by some intelligence. So, and, you know, in reality, DFM verification tools can be integrated much more easily than PCB CAD. If you've got a EDA flow that you're using, uh, to try and plug something in midstream in that can be challenging. But DFM is kind of an exception. You've got the capability to share that data into that DFM tool, take that information back to your EDA tool and, and carry forward with it. So what does ADM look like? Well, it's ADM stands for Advanced Design for Manufacturing, and it's our DFM verification check engine. Um, it runs and displays results in Zook and CAD or CAM tools, um, but it doesn't solely rely on a Zook and environment. Um, you know, there's multiple flows for users that are Zook and users, and then a third party flow that runs from intelligent format. In this case, ODB++ is the main format that we lean on for this, but we're investigating expanding that into the 2581 space as well. So what the engine basically looks like or the, the rule editor looks like is, you know, it's a, a GUI based form that allows you to create some very complex rules. So you can define specialized rules for flex and rigid flex. Um, it has this HTML web-based interface for rule creation and rule management, um, and also a wizard that kind of walks you through the rule creation process. Uh, you can design for vendor-specific manufacturing for fab assembly, um, and then you can 
execute those rules in our engine and then output those rules very intelligently to Excel. Um, so not only do you get the coordinates of the rule of the error, uh, a description of the error, you get a screenshot of the error. So all the things that you need to go and chase down that issue and resolve it. Um, let's see, I think that's good. So from a flow perspective, you would log into the rule manager in any web browser and you can create these object rules. So you can specify your parameters and create these check items. And then those check items can be integrated into a rule file. So I can have multiple rule files that manage different technologies or different producibility levels or different vendors. Um, and once I have that library of rule objects, I can load my design via ODB++ or from natively from Zucan into the cockpit and execute those rule checks and then view the output of that. So, you know, it's a basically a wizard that walks you through rule creation. Those rules get added into a rule deck, you execute against the rule deck, and then you act on the output. So what's so different about a flex or a rigid flex design? There's a lot of objects in this space that traditional PCB or EDA tools don't accommodate well. Um, there's stiffeners, adhesives, foils, cover lays, LPI, uh, stack up sections. And then there's elements that are more mm, ethereal, uh, bend lines and bend areas. And also, you know, it's a 3D object in general. Uh, you know, most PCBs are in general 2D products, but you've got some space considerations and height considerations to accommodate. Flex has a lot more in the 3D space. You've got to be able to visual, visualize those bends and check against them um, and ensure that those bends are resulting in a product that you expect. So, you know, with this rule engine, you can accommodate these types of things. Not only can you check object to object, you can check if an object is found that relies on another object, does it exist? So if I have a stiffener and that stiffener requires an adhesive, well, if I've defined the stiffener, I can check the characteristics of that stiffener. And I can also check for the presence of an adhesive as well as the characteristics of that adhesive. So you've got to be able to kind of uh, build kind of an order of operations in these checks. Um, and it has the capability to do that. So just some sample rules from one of our customers. Um, you know, just in the bend area space, they're looking at through hole, the plated through hole. They're looking at a keep out and a spacing rule. So they want no, uh, through hole or plated through holes in the in that bend area, as well as a spacing allowance. So you can build multiple facets to this. Um, if you're looking at stiffener, you're looking at an adhesive, and that adhesive has to be 0.4 millimeters inside the boundary of the stiffener. Um, you can look at the minimum size of that stiffener. You can look at spacing to holes, uh, spacing to the outline for cover lay. You know, it just goes on and on. Uh, this is just a sample of some of their rules, but there's a lot of aspects here that we can start building intelligence into and checking against. So we'll take a quick look at a demonstration. We're gonna review the rule manager. Um, we'll perform some ADM checks against a design. We'll review those results in Design Force, um, and we'll show you an example of an automation to execute those checks. So up until now, I've been talking about kind of a manual operation where you import your design, you execute the checks, you review the results. We also have the ability to automate that so that you can just basically hit go and a script executes and runs those checks and the output of that automation is an Excel file that you can then review. 
um, to, to kind of analyze what errors were found and where those errors are in within your design. Okay. So let me escape out of here. Do this. So from the rule manager, if you log in as admin, you basically have God powers to go in and start creating rules. Now there's a lot of existing rules and then there's a lot of custom rules that can be created. So a few hundred existing rules that you can leverage, but also additional rules that you can create. So in this case, we're checking for spacing for stiffeners. In another case, we're looking at a spacing between silver shield and silk screen. And then here we're talking about arbitrary check. This is the fully custom. There's 17 types of checks, clearance, overlap, does exist, and so on. And then I can specify some layer combinations, what I want that clearance to, or what I want that check to look like, and then build out that rule deck. I can also have guest level access to the rule deck. And basically, this is a reviewer. So I can search and pull that rule file local. And then once I open that up, so then you can review that there. Now, from within a design, let me back up just a little bit. So from within the design, I've got the ability to specify what checks I want to execute at a particular design phase. So if I'm just in, let's say I've got a complex placement and I just want to look at placement checks, I can have a grouping here on the left for placement checks and I can execute those after my placement phase. So this doesn't have to be all done in one fell swoop on the back end of your design phase. I would recommend doing it in steps um, to ensure a, a minimal amount of impact of change. But you want to execute these checks in phases. And when you look at the FPC checks here, we've got just a few samples, but we've got some silkscreen checks, some shield checks, some stiffener checks, and bare copper checks. And so when we execute that check, and again, this can be automated to do it in the background. It reaches out to the check engine server, which can be local, or it can be on one of your performance machines, and it executes those checks. And then it brings up the review panel. And if I select those objects, it takes me to those check items. So as I click on an element, it takes me to the layer combination that's affected, and then what that error is. So here we've got an error in the stiffener, there's insufficient clearance, and we've got silkscreen check or silkscreen text error to a stiffener as well. And so I can send groupings of items to the canvas. I've also got the ability in this form that drives that Excel output to annotate some information on there. So, you know, in this case, need to fix, but there's other options there. I could say this is an approved error. In other words, there's no way around this. We're going to have to live with it. So I've got, you know, basically seven different options I can choose there. And then within the Excel information, this all goes with it. So I've got the check value, the error value, the coordinates, as well as a screenshot when I dump this out to Excel. Looks a little bit like this. And there that output is complete. And if we open it up, 
we get kind of an overview page that's a report, and then we can push into the results. And that gives us information. It shows us the layer combinations that are affected, the coordinates, what the error is, and then any annotations or commentary that's been added. And then for an automation example, from the canvas, I can launch that and specify an ODB++ file. It's going to grab that ODB++ file from a third-party vendor. It's going to import that. And then there's this step here called setting files. Those setting files are significant because there are attributes that are associated to layers or objects that may toggle on or off check behavior. And so this is kind of a, a basically a mapping file that instructs the tool how to interpret the data that it's reading in from ODB++ and add additional intelligence to it. And now it's ready to run ADM, loading that mapping file as well. And then it's loading a rule deck with the XAR. And then it's running that check set, FPCL2. And now it's starting the check process. And it's complete. And basically from here, I've got the ability to review or to output that data. We can also integrate it into that execution script uh, to automatically output the Excel data um, if you want to go straight to the review phase. And so here we've got overlap between coverlay and LPI. We've got a resistance or a, a resist clearance error, bend area error where we've got a via that's too close to a bend area. And then we can also view that flex in 3D in the tool using the bend area, the bend line, and the bend element that's associated to that bend line. In other words, what's the bend direction? What's the radius? So. And we can integrate or accommodate multiple bend areas as well. One more time, I've got to switch the display settings. So we went through and reviewed that. So what are my session takeaways? Well, you know, you need a single DFM CAM solution to support flex and rigid flex PCB manufacturing processes. It's a complex, complex problem that you really don't want to accommodate the, uh, the issues that are found on the back end of your design phase. You really want to analyze early, often, and ensure that what you're sending to fab and assembly and test is producible. You know, one of the ways to get there is to support industry standard formats and via direct import into our Zook and Suite. Um, work with your suppliers to establish those rules. Collaborate. You know, understand early in the design phase from Sierra, what are their needs? What are their uh, parameters that they're going to want to check against? Um, so that really helps with you having as clean of a process introduction or a product introduction process as possible. And, you know, shorten that learning curve with wizards that allow you to configure rules um, and share that information across multiple sites. You know, share it with your partners, share it with your, within your team. Um, you know, so often there's this knowledge base that is people dependent. And that's all well and good, but you know, in this era, that's that's a limiting factor, especially with the remote work environment that so many of us are dealing with. 
um, you know, institutionalization is really a significant piece of streamlining remote work. Um, and so, you know, we feel that we offer a very clean, very productive uh, design platform, uh, you know, and if you're interested in learning more, just let us know. And Lucy and Amit, that was what I had. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to answer just a couple more questions. And we'll get started with the Q&A right away. So just okay. so you know, Sierra Circuits has a flex expert who is uh, on the webinar right now. So please feel free to use the Q&A section to ask any question you may have. And uh, we will answer everything to you. Uh, so just so you know, yes, you will get the recording and you will get the slides. I will send you everything tomorrow. Okay, so Amit, I think you can get started and answer the questions live. Sure. Right now we have a lot of easy questions. So I hope people ask tougher questions. But anyways, um, Hong, are you there? Can you hear me? Hmm. I'll start with some pricing. Yeah, questions. I'm here. You. Oh, okay, great. There is a question about stiffeners. Um, what are the adhesive requirements? Like, do you need at least two mils of adhesive thickness? Um, do you need different types of adhesive requirements for aluminum versus FR4? And does adhesive improve reliability? I hope. They were listening to the presentation where I said adhesive does not improve reliability. But anyways, give them an answer. Okay. Um, when you talk about a stiffener, right? And uh, what stiffener we, 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 we're looking for? We're looking for a captain stiffener for a zip connector. Uh, you're looking for the FR4 stiffener for, for the support for loading the SMT. Uh, you're looking for the... Metal stiffener is a hissing and for the lightweight or something else. And depend on what application we're looking for, you know, the captain stiffener, if they, 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 they build like a cover like by themselves, that means they got a hissing and the captain material. And that one, they have to use the thermal set. And the FR4 material, and you got a two options. Uh, you can do the thermal set by you uh, adhesive. Uh, you 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 uh, adhesive. They call the press sensitive PSA. That means you install after you go through the or the SMT when to reflow. For the the metal for metal to the like the hixing or lightweight and whatever, most of the time I see they using the press sensitive adhesive to apply it. But uh, right now, Sierra not uh, refer to offer any metal stiffener at all. Okay, thanks. Uh, so another question aside from uh, stiffeners, uh, or no, same question uh, on the stiffener side. Um, would you say the adhesive detracts from reliability in the stiffener area? And any other design considerations for, st for stiffeners as in regards to adhesives? Mm. The stiffener, only for the zip connector, it, it, it stay. But you know, the rest of the stiffener, like the rigid stiffener, 
the reason why on my office hanging all around all the board I built, and if I keep watching on the day and the time when the stiffener, FR4 stiffener with a thermal set will fall out, they will fall out by time because the moisture absorbed on it and later on they will fail. But who cares after you've done component everything in there, uh, most of the time that, that job done. Okay, got it, thank you. Um, and then someone has a question on um, a basic design question on what is the minimum track width that we should use in routing on the flex area? What does that mean? Uh, what's the minimum trace and space for flex area? Tray and space, the flex area? I refer yeah. three and a half, three and a half. That's a standard for the half out. One out, you need more than that. Depends on a couple way. If it's a third ounce? One third out. Um, look at this. You don't have the row and nail, the one third out copper, really rare play to do one, and they will be ED. And when you, you design that one for uh, dynamic, uh, I'm not offered to use it. If you're using for uh, the low voltage and you know high speed, whatever, maybe, but it's not good for dynamic bending. And if you're looking for that one third out copper and three and three, don't go, you know, it, it, it thinner than that. Flex different with a rigid adhesion for the dry film to hold on during etching, uh, totally different with uh, the regular copper on a rigid. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I think those, that kind of covers it. Let me see. Um, like after what layer count would you say a flex board is really not a flex board anymore? What does that mean? So they want to know the maximum number of layer count for a flex board. Okay, um, when you do a loose lip, right? And the bendable of the six layer flex is still available. And a layer flex and you start with half out still available, but depend on the distance of the, the flex, it, it loose lip, you know, to, for the rigid flex bending together. But if you use a multi-layer flag, uh, don't try more than six layer. It, it, it bad, it, not healthy. You can, uh, um, you can, uh, how we call that? You're not abandon, you don't like a fold to install. One time it's okay, but I, okay. I, I'm, I'm not comf uh, comfortable with, you know, uh, more than six layer flag. Okay, got it. Uh, someone's asking about epoxy beading. When is it required or is it always just a good idea? And then how do they specify it on the cap notes? On the rigid flag, um, if you, uh, you, 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 you install one time, you don't need to. If you try to get this one installed and, and take out install and uh, on a box CBD, it helps to secure, you know, the transition between rigid and flat to hold them tight. Um, if the more it, it, it thinner than uh, 30 mil, it really has to add, apply a boxy there because the a boxy when you you fill it in, they, they get like the breath. They, they, they grow it before they, 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 they shrug it out. And if, if the, the, the thickness on the, the wall tie, it, it's so thin. Uh, uh, I'm not offered to that one because they may flow on, on the surface. But you know, the, the, 
the aboxybidin it uh, referred you know for uh, the rich flag job and and keep in mind they got a two kind of epoxy some of them it except for the algorithm and, and some of them is not and most of them secure and they use the uh, they use the uh, carbon you know 45 15 uh, black and clear for most standard, but you know, when they go to the algasin, they have to consider the 3M, um, what they call 60 something. I've, I don't have in my mind right now for the gray. That's good for the algasin, and most of the, the, the customer on the, the spray, they use it. Okay, yeah, we'll send the information as a follow up after. Um, Someone has a question about um, Ben Radius, like um, uh, just, is there any such thing as a tolerance of a Ben Radius? What does that mean? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, because we have to uh, uh, specify and, and whatever. Sometimes whatever the design to go to beyond that bending radius, by the number calculation because that number not like whatever is in there. And some people, they want a snap, a snapshot bending and, and they have to, to make the zig, you know, the, the thermal set that one at the sharp corner for they can straighten out. And they, they form in that way. And uh, I see really few design, they do that, but you know, they, they have to, make you know the zig to install that one after they claim they put in the oven they they performing on the set bending a sharp set bending and uh, regular we cannot do that on a cold by you you flex it okay got it um, i think that's it for now Does anyone have any last minute questions? All the questions that had to do with uh, electrical engineering, um, we will send follow up answers uh, since we don't have a representation from our engineering team. But those are good questions. And um, anyone else who has a question that I kind of said I'll answer offline uh, please be patient. We'll get back to you in the next day or so. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's it. Lucy, back to you. Thanks, Hong. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Thank okay. you, everyone. Wong, Steve from Zuken, Amy from Zuken. Thank you to everyone who attended. And uh, we'll send you everything tomorrow regarding slides. Thank you for joining. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you guys.